Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and in this video we're going to troubleshoot heating problems on the cooling system of a vehicle and I'm going to be using the MGB GT because I do have a problem with this car so I can actually show you. I'm going to take you through all the individual steps on how I approach a cooling problem and we might all have our own method of doing it but maybe this might help you. We're going to do some testing, we're going to do some visual inspections, and we're going to do some replacements. And I will even do replacements on this car, which are not the problem. I just want to show you on how you can do certain things. So, let's start. And the first step is always a visual inspection. The first thing you want to check on your car is that you have no leaking hoses. So check where the hoses are connected to each other. Check that the hoses have no cracks or openings and also that they are very well attached towards the other parts. So that the bands or the spanners or whatever you want, the clamps are really tight and in a good condition. If you see white deposits between the attached part and the hose, that is typically a sign that the hose is sweating. So you actually have some vapor leak there or some small liquid leak and that will show up over time that you, uh, by the fact that you will have to keep filling up your cooling liquid. So that's the first thing. Of course, it's not only this hose on the top of the radiator. You need to check all the hoses on the car. So inside this black box here, I have a little radiator, a heat exchanger, which is going to be heated up by my cooling water. And these are the hoses. And that is going to be used to heat up the, um, the cockpit. Now, the hoses could be bad. The radiator inside could be bad. So check for leaks there as well. If you have a mechanical water pump, like on this car, then check that the V-snare, which is driving the water pump on this pulley here, is in a good shape and that it's tight. It shouldn't be slipping. And also check that your radiator is not blocked. So it could be that there was some paper or some plastic bags flew in while you were driving or leaves or anything else that could clog up the front part of your radiator and therefore the airstream can't get through anymore, so the cooling efficiency of your radiator would go down. So check that out, that you have free airflow through the radiator. So you may have to take some grills off to get to it, like in this case, but I can see through the holes here that there is nothing blocking that, so that is a good thing. But check that as well. And listen to the water pump. Make sure that it doesn't make any screaming or scraping sound, because if it does, then it's time for replacement. And also check that the water pump is not leaking because sometimes they do leak on their spindle. Let me show you a bit of a close-up of a water pump on how that looks like. Um, so here we have a new water pump for this car and they will differ in shape depending on the car. But this is a mechanical water pump. Uh, yours may be a different one. Uh, you could have even an electrical one. But the mechanical water pump is driven typically by a pulley and a V-snare, as you have seen. And inside you have scoops, something like a turbine, and that's going to turn around and it's going to push water through the system. So the water pump is responsible for pushing water through the engine and the radiator. Um, it can be that these scoops are now been broken off uh, or they are heavy polluted. And in some cases, you have actually leaks to the internal parts to where, towards the axle where the pulley fits on. So if you look on the other side, here is that pulley, and you can have water drips coming out here out of the side. So if that is the case, then the seal is gone, and you will have to replace the water pump. I'm going to replace the water pump on this car, uh, not because the one that I have is really faulty, as far as I know, but I still like to have a new one because after about 100,000 kilometers, I think it's about time to change it. And I like to have my cars in the tip-top condition. So now that we have done our visual inspection and there is really nothing wrong with our hoses or the water pump or anything else that we could see or hear, the belt is good, it's time to do a pressure test. Now your cooling system is typically under pressure and the reason for that is that we want to raise the boiling level of the cooling liquid. What we don't want is that the cooling liquid starts to boil because then the cooling efficiency is down the drain completely. So that is why uh, modern cars and even older cars like this one have a pressurized cooling system. They have an expansion tank and I'll show you all that in a few minutes. And on that expansion tank or on the radiator there is what we call a pressure cap. 
And on that pressure cap, there is a number printed in it. And that's the amount of pressure that you can put in the cooling system without destroying the cooling system. And that pressure is what we're going to apply to the cooling system to detect if we have leaks. Now, most of the leaks you can see on the outside. But if you have a leak inside the engine, there is a crack between a cooling channel and maybe an oil channel, you might not see it. You might see it on the dipstick. You might see some white foam on the dipstick inside the oil, and we'll check on that car in a few minutes. Uh, that would be an indication that you have cooling liquid coming into the oil, and that would be bad, and that would be a bad repair. It may be your head gasket, that's also possible. But some of the leaks you won't see. And this is why I want to do a pressure test. Now, if you need to do a pressure test, you're going to need some tools. And I have a toolbox here. And if you are a do-it-yourself guy, uh, you can buy this for about 70 euros or $17. It gives you all kinds of adapters. And, and I'll show that to you in a few seconds. It gives you a pressure pump. So it's really handy for troubleshooting any type of car. It also allows you to apply pressure. It also allows you to fill the car, uh, the cooling system with a vacuum system. It allows you to test the pressure cap and so on. And, and we'll do all this uh, in this video. So first of all, let me show you a check on the dipstick. So let's pull out the dipstick and check the oil. So here's the dipstick and this oil looks good. There is no deposit on it. If you had a deposit on it, that would mean you have a leak from a cooling channel into the oil channel. Most likely the head gasket, so that would be a little bit more severe. But in this case, we don't have that problem. And then I'm going to show you the expansion tank and the pressure cap and the marking on it. And then we will actually do the pressure test. And this is the expansion tank. Yours might be a plastic one, but in principle you have a hose going to your radiator and you have an overflow hose. And on the top, you got your pressure cap. The idea about the expansion tank is that when the cooling liquid gets warmer, it's going to expand in volume. And you don't want to lose that because when the engine cools down, you want to suck back in that cooling fluid. So if you didn't have an expansion tank, that cooling liquid would spill over by this hose on the street. And then when the engine cools down, the volume gets down of the cooling liquid and you have not enough cooling liquid anymore. But in this way, the cooling liquid is inside. Uh, when the engine gets hot, it pushes cooling liquid over this hose inside the expansion unit. This fills up and then when the engine cools down, the cooling liquid in the engine reduces in volume and it's going to suck out cooling liquid back out of the expansion tank, back into the radiator or in the cooling system. So that way, we always allow for expansion and shrinkage of the cooling liquid itself without losing the cooling liquid. I think that's uh, very important to know. There is an overflow on here, as you can see. And the overflow is there to release pressure once the pressure is higher than the rated pressure on the pressure cap. And this is the pressure cap. And I'm going to show that to you in a close-up so you can really see what this is about. This is also the cap that you should not remove when the engine is warm because it's under pressure and the cooling liquid will become steaming out right on you're going to get burned. So let's have a look on this cap a little bit closer so you can see it and then we do the test. So here we have the pressure cap and if you look closely you see LBS 15. That means that the pressure cap here will hold the pressure in the cooling system up to 15 LSB or 15 PSI. If the pressure goes higher than that, you see we have a spring system here that will push this down and it will allow the excess pressure to escape by the overflow. If the pressure goes back down, this valve closes up again. And it's important that you have a good working cap. So we're going to test the cap and we're going to test the cooling system towards the right pressure. So we're going to apply pressure onto the cooling system of 15 PSI in my case because that's what my pressure cap tells me. And I'm going to let it sit there for about an hour, maybe two hours. I'm going to have my lunch or my coffee or whatever. And then I come back and the pressure should not have gone down. If it goes down, it means you have a leak somewhere. A leak somewhere that you haven't seen. A leak maybe inside the engine block. 
and then it's time for some serious investigations. Now to do the test, you will have to remove the actual cap and fit a special adapter cap that will fit in that allows you to connect a pressure pump. And this is the pressure pump that comes with this kit. And this is a very cheap kit. It's not something you want to have for daily use, but it's great for the do-it-yourself guy. And we're going to pump up the system until we have the desired pressure, and then we let it sit there. So all what we need to do is connect this uh, adapter and then connect the hose to the adapter and just pump it up and go for a coffee. So let's do that. So let's put up the test cap, make sure it's tight and closed. And now we can hook up the pump and we're gonna increase the pressure to about 15 PSI and then we'll check it. Um, this is a bit of pumping. But you can see that the needle is going up Right now I'm at about nine, but I need to go to about 15, right? And as you can see, we are now at about 15 PSI and the needle is pretty steady. So we don't really have a leak in this car. So we are good. I'm gonna let it sit here for about an hour. I'm gonna have a coffee and then I'll come back. Okay, so that was a good coffee guys. So here you go, pressure is still there, so I'm very pleased with this, so I'm just gonna release it. So now I know that I have no leaks on this car. If your pressure was going down, then you need to figure out where that is, and that can be a little bit difficult, especially if you don't see any leaks on the outside, then most likely you will have a blown gasket between a cooling channel and a cylinder and then uh, you will most likely see air bubbles in your cooling liquid once the engine is running because it's going to blow inside. We now know that this car doesn't lose its pressure so we know we don't have a leak in this car. A very often forgotten part is the pressure cap. This could be faulty, it may be open all the time, the seal may be gone. Uh, so we need to test this that it is actually opening up at around 15 psi. So let's check this out. And the kit that I showed you before actually has all the adapters to do so. So let's test the cap itself. So for that I need an adapter and I can put the cap on there. And on the other side, which is this side, I will need the other adapter or stop so I can actually blow in here or pressurize this blue tube here. And with that in place, I should now be able to connect the hose to it and inflate it and see at what time I actually have the cap opening up. So let's see if we can do this and you guys can see it. It might be a little bit more difficult. So I'm gonna pump it up and let's see what happens. Well, almost at 15 and you know what? I can't go above it and I can actually see and hear that the cap is releasing air. So this is a good working cap. So normally while you're driving, you have an airflow coming through the radiator to cool down the cooling liquid. And at that time, your radiator has a high efficiency. However, if you're sitting in front of a traffic light or in a traffic queue, then you don't have that airflow anymore. And at that moment in time, uh, the cooling liquid will warm up very rapidly. So therefore you need some aid, you need some help to cool down that cooling liquid in the radiator by creating an airflow. And to do so, uh, we typically have a fan. Now, some cars have an electrical fan, this one has. Other cars have a mechanical fan typically mounted onto the water pump. So the mechanical fan on the water pump isn't going to do a lot because your engine will be running at idle when you sit in a traffic queue or in front of a traffic light. It will help a bit, but not a lot, even if you have a shroud around it. A electrical fan is far more efficient, and especially if you have one that can run at different speeds and can be controlled at different speeds. The one that I have is only a two-speed fan, so it's either on, low, on, high. So I want to check out that my fan is really working because that could be the problem. 
Now, typically, you would hear it when you are stuck in a traffic queue, the temperature goes up. You should be hearing your fan kicking in. Now, I didn't hear that kicking in here. So this is all part of the observations of what is happening at what time. That is very important that you do that. So uh, I'm going to check now on what the issue is with the fan. Now, fans are controlled by a switch, a temperature-based switch, and that's typically sitting around your thermostat housing. And we'll look at that in a minute. It's always sitting on the hot side of the radiator. So the hot side is the top hose. Now I know some radiators have horizontal radiators, but it's always the top hose. If you follow that hose, you will end up on the thermostat housing. And then finally, there, you, around that area, you should find the thermo switch. Sometimes it's on the radiator, and that's the switch that's going to drive the fan. Now some of these switches can drive a lot of power, and you don't need a relay. Other of these switches do require a relay. And then others, again, are really high-end tech uh, detectors or sensors that will talk to a control unit, and that control unit will drive the RPMs of your uh, fan. So we call that a modulated uh, fan. Now, this car is old. It doesn't have a modulated fan. Newer cars may have that. So think about that. Uh, I like to fix simple cars. I don't like these uh, cars with too much electronics. Uh, it's too hard to fix sometimes. And... It's hard to diagnose and it's hard to get the parts for it. You always have to buy complete modules and I don't like that. Anyway, so let's check out the fan on this car. Uh, this car has a relay as well. So um, I did some checks on it already where the relay is because you've got to find the relay. And before you take things apart, check that the fan fuse is intact, right? So that would be the first thing, making sure that the fuse in the fuse box for your radiator fan is still good. In my case, the fuse was good, so now uh, I'm going to check the relay, where it is. Uh, and this car has been messed around with in the past by someone else. So it's going to be a little bit difficult to find it, but I found it. And then we're going to see what happens. So let's do that. And after that, we'll take it to the next step where we're going to take apart uh, some of the elements. I'm going to take off the water pump to show you. I'm going to take out the uh, thermo switch. I'm going to take out the thermostat to check the thermostat because that could be another problem. Um, so, and then we'll replace all the cooling fluid. So there's a bit of work to be done on this car. So if you can see it below all the high tension leads, we have actually the thermostat housing. This is the hose that is going back to the top of the radiator. So this is the hot side. And then you see the two red connectors here. This is my uh, thermo switch, which is going to control my fan. So this is an on and off switch. This is not a modulator one. So I'm not going to take it out, but basically what this guy does, uh, if it comes to about 98 degrees centigrade, it's going to close the contact and it's going to turn on the fan through a relay because the fan is drawing a lot of uh, current and this sensor here is not capable of driving all that current through its contacts. So you need to put an intermediate relay in. And the relay is a switch with a low side and a high side. So you turn on the relay on the low side with low current, and then the contact closes. And then on the high side, you can draw far more current. And here we have such relay. Uh, this is a 12 volts, 40 amps relay. And if you want to know what the contacts are, here you have all the pins. You have them with five pins, four pins. There's two pins used to drive the relay and two pins for in and out towards the fan. And if you look on the side here, uh, you should be able to see the symbol, what it all means. There are numbers on it, and then you can relate the numbers in the back, because the same numbers are on the back, and then you know exactly how to connect it. And pin number 85 and 86, one side will be connected to ground, and the other side will go actually to your temperature sensor, which will then uh, connect uh, towards the plus 12 volts. So if um, the temperature comes too high, current will flow through that coil over 85 and 86 and the relay armature will attract and then there will be a contact between 0.30 and 0.87. And that's the way you go in to deliver power to your fan. So here is that relay uh, that drives the fan and I have traced the cables from the fan and the sensing unit all the way back to the relay. It was hard to find but you can see the mess that people have made here. 
Uh, on the relay, we have two thick cables, and these happen to be the 30 and the 87 connectors. These are the ones that are driving the power to the fan. So if I'm going to connect those two together, then the fan should turn on, if there is nothing wrong with the fan, of course. And I'm going to open that relay a little bit and use a jumper cable to do so. Uh, so let's see, and don't make a short to ground because this is supposed to be the 12 volts, right? So here is my other side, and here it is. So let me try that out. And the fan comes on, so now I have at least a good working fan, nothing wrong with that. The next step is to see if the relay is really working. Now for that, I need to apply power to the primary, uh, the control side of the relay. But I noticed that I don't have all the cables. There's a, there's, there's a plus 12 volts coming in, and there's the one going to the fan. There is a loose wire here, there's another loose wire here, and there's another small black one here, which is then kind of mysteriously connected to a yellow one. Now if I trace that wire, I can see it's ending up right here on this side of the relay. So this is the low side of the relay. So if I ground that, then it most likely will come on. I notice that I have the plus 12 volts on the other side because that little white cable is connected here as well to the 12 volts. So this should probably work. So if I find a good ground, and I'm just gonna clip on something here, and I would apply it to this yellow wire here, then if the relay is good, the fan will come on. And it does come on. So the relay is good, the fan is good. It is just totally screwed up cabling. And that is something you see quite often on cars, older cars, that the cabling is so bad that you really need to redo it. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to fix this cabling on the relay and I'm probably going to install a new relay closer to the fan itself. And then I'm going to eliminate all this crazy wiring here. All right. And this is the mess that came from underneath the dashboard. I don't know what they have done before, but they totally screwed it up. I installed the new relay for the fan and closer to the fan as well, so I could get rid of all the clutter from underneath the dashboard. And you can see actually the diagram on how that is cabled up. And here I have my thermo switch. That's the switch that will ground the relay so that the ventilator or the fan can kick in. This is happening at around 98 degrees centigrade because that's the rating I have on this one. But of course now the engine is cold so it's not going to work. So I'm going to bypass it or short it basically and then the fan should really turn on. So let's see if we can get this working or not. And I need to make my shortcut here uh, to ground and then see. And there goes the fan. And that's working real well. So I'm just gonna put things back because I'm going to remove anyway the um, the sensor to check it out in some hot water to see if it really does what it's supposed to do. And we're also going to replace the thermostat. So, um, yeah, we, we will have still to take this apart and that's why the cabling isn't cleaned up yet. And it's always a good idea to check things out after you changed or modified wiring because you never know. So I'm going to try to crank it up and then turn on the lights, the blinkers, you know, all that stuff to see if that all works. Well, that is at least working, and the lights are working, the blinkers are working, so I'm quite happy. So we have fixed one problem on this car, which was the cooling fan. But now imagine that that was not the problem, and you still have a heating problem. Well, then there is an easy way to kind of identify where the problem could be. If you sense the temperature on the top hose of the radiator, so the water coming from the engine, so the hot side, but be careful because this can be very hot. 
feel how hot that is and then feel on the bottom hose which is the hose on the bottom of the radiator which is going to the water pump feel that hose and if that hose is cold or a little bit warm then you have a problem with flow in other words the water isn't flowing through the radiator through the water pump into the engine and then back out there's a couple of reasons why this can happen one of the reasons is that the radiator is actually blocked. The channels inside are very small and over time they can get blocked, especially if you get debris from the cooling chambers inside the engine or whatever, and it gets inside the little channels and then it starts clogging them up. Another reason often seen is that there was a leak before and people have poured in a leak stop and that is a product that stops small leaks in the radiator, but quite often it's going to start clogging up your channels as well so never use that product so we will have to check the radiator for a flow through therefore we'll have to remove the hoses on the top and on the bottom let the cooling liquid go and then pour some water in the top and see how much comes out on the back or on the bottom and that will tell you if you have, your radiator is uh, having enough flow or not so that's one possibility the other possibility is, and is that the thermostat in the thermostat house is not opening up. It's stuck. It, it might be stuck closed and, and, or stuck open, but it's stuck. And in most cases, uh, if you don't have no circulation, and yet the dial in on, on the dashboard shows that the engine is hot, uh, that is most likely than the thermostat, which is stuck and doesn't open up. So we will check the thermostat and make sure that it operates properly. And then finally, uh, which is the last thing, is the water pump. Now, the water pump may have an issue. Um, it could be that the scoops are worn out, uh, there's too much play on it. And in fact, it could even be that the scoops are no longer turning with the axle, which is driven by the pulley. So then the pump doesn't do what it's supposed to do anymore. So these are a few more things to check, and we will do this. Now, in terms of the water pump, uh, I'm going to replace this one with a new one. Uh, just because I have a new one and um, yeah this one is already um, quite uh, some years old so it still works but uh, I still like to replace it so I'm sure getting I'm sure gonna get a better circulation through the engine because these engines are quite sensitive to heat and then a final thing uh, which is something which is really annoying on this car is that you may have air bubbles in your cooling system and you don't want to have air bubbles because they're going to lock things up and i am almost sure that i'm going to have some air bubbles here if you look on the height where the expansion tank is um, it's just about level so i won't be able to fill everything up and i'm going to have air trapped in this one in this tube here uh, because this is actually a modified car so it would have been better if this tube would have been in another direction but what I'm going to do is to have a self-sealing tap inside this tube so I can actually vent it out and then lock it up again so still a little bit of things to do so let's carry on and the first thing we're going to do right now is to check if the radiator is actually having free flow through it so for the radiator flow test we will need to drain the cooling limit first and to do so I will remove the bottom hose on the radiator I'm actually catching the uh, cooling liquid because I don't want it to have uh, into the environment so I'm going to dispose of it one other thing is that you don't want to uh, reuse this uh, you should never do that that is not a good idea here we go So now that the cooling liquid is drained out of the radiator, I'm just going to put a hose on the radiator on the bottom. So whatever we flush through the radiator is going to come out right here in this bucket that I have underneath. So now I'm going to connect the hose to the top of the radiator so I can pour in some fresh water so we can flush the radiator itself. And you will see that on the bottom. I will have the camera pointing to the bottom hose and we'll see what the flow will be through the radiator and hopefully that will be a good flow if it's not well then you have a problem now you don't need to use a bucket or something like this you can also use a garden hose to flush that through so let me get a little step here to get to it because otherwise uh, i can't film what comes out of it all right So 
So I have disconnected the top hose on the radiator and I installed a 90 degrees elbow on it so I can pour water in here to flush the radiator. I'm standing on a step, but you don't need to do this. You can do it on the ground. But the reason I'm doing this is just because um, I want to film what comes out of it. So to give you guys a better view. All right, so let me put a funnel up here and then we'll start testing the flow through the radiator. And you really want to flush the radiator until the water that comes out is absolutely clean. What you have seen here is that this radiator is having a very good flow through. And at the end, the water that came through was very clean. So we know this radiator is good. Now, in case your radiator was really dripping, it was not really having that flow, that means that your channels are blocked and you should actually get the radiator either really cleaned out well if you can but that is always a bit of a problem but the better thing is to replace the core of the radiator or just get a new radiator so now we have three more areas that can cause poor cooling because the cooling liquid is not flowing as it's supposed to flow and that will actually be the thermostat that could be blocking it could be the water pump and it could be air bubbles in one of the hoses. So we're gonna start with removing the thermostat and check that out. And the role of a thermostat is very simple. It regulates the temperature of the cooling liquid. It is a valve that will open up and close. And here we have that valve right here. This is a thermostat. In the back, you will see a spring and that spring actually uh, closes the, the valve right there. Now this specific one is a wax filled thermostat. What that means is that inside the brass cylinder that you see in the middle, we have wax and wax is hard when it's cold and when it gets warmed up, it is liquid. And then it actually expands and the expansion of the wax when it's melted will overcome the force of the spring and it will open up the thermostat. So what that means is that when the engine is cold, the thermostat is closed and we have a very rapid warm up of the engine. And this is exactly what we want. You don't want to drive the car with a cold engine because that's a lot of wear and tear. And we could have a talk on that for a long time, but it all has to see with the bearings on the big ends, for instance, where the, the, the crankshaft is running on the layer of uh, oil. And if that gap is too big, then the oil leaks out. If the gap is too narrow, then you lose that coat of this layer of oil. So then you get more wear and tear. So it's important that the car runs at its normal operating temperature. And that's what the thermostat will do for us. Now, this thermostat right here is an 88 degree centigrade thermostat. Normally, it's printed on it. And here it is. I'm not sure if you can see it but you can get them in different gradings depending on where you live. Cold climates would typically have a higher grading and warmer climates would have a lower grading. So uh, let's remove the existing one and then see if what I have here is exactly the same or not. I'm going to make some space um, so, uh, so we can work on the thermostat housing. So let me move these ignition or these high tension leads aside. So we have a better view actually right here on the thermostat housing. I'm also going to remove this hose here because that's in the way and we would have to take it off anyhow. So all right. I'm also going to disconnect the thermostat switch for the fan. So we don't need this for the moment. Let me move that aside a bit. And I think I will turn around a bit the distributor. I have it marked so I can put it back where it was before. So that always helps. So let me do that. You might have noticed this black band here. This is nothing special, guys. This is something I put up sometimes if the hoses are slightly too big, but also to smoothen out some of the surface. And this is nothing more than the inner tube of a bicycle. And here is that inner tube of a bicycle. I just cut off a piece and then I slide it over and it's really tight and it really helps a lot. And there's one bolt right there and the other bolt is on the opposite side. So uh, let's try and see if we can undo those. Oh, it's not that hard. This one is easy. And in fact, it's quite loose to be honest. And I will also release the other side. So 
So now we should be able to remove that housing. And here it is, and that looks still quite clean, I think. Um, so the actual thermostat is right here. Uh, so let's see if we can get it out. And here it is. Uh, that's the thermostat, guys. So here we have the two thermostats. The old one, uh, the one we took out of the car, and this is an 88 degrees centigrade thermostat, same as the new one. They look very identical with one major difference. Uh, you can see here we have a big opening and somebody drilled this out to have more flow through the system when the thermostat is closed. So when the car is cold, you're still going to have some flow. Uh, sometimes people tend to do this to prevent thermic shock. Uh, whenever the thermostat opens up, you would normally get colder water coming in from the radiator right into the engine block, and people refer to that sometimes as a cold shock. That's why you see sometimes uh, bigger holes that are being drilled into the um, bypass, let's say, of the thermostat. Now, I don't really think that's necessary. Um, the new thermostat doesn't have that, and it has a small bleed hole, and there's in the back a little ball uh, right here. I don't know if you can see that little ball inside, a steel ball, so it acts a bit like a valve. One other thing which is important is to note that the thermostat is always installed with the wax tube towards the engine and the other side towards the radiator. Don't put them in reverse because then you're going to have a bit of a problem. So now uh, I'm going to test the old thermostat and I'm going to do this by putting it in hot water and see at what moment in time it's going to open up. We're going to test the thermostat and I will submerge it in a pan of hot water and right now it's around 50 degrees centigrade but I'm going to slowly let it come up to temperature and then we'll see what is going to happen actually with the thermostat. So let me submerge it into the water and then we will crank up the heat on it and see what happens. And then we're going to crank up the heat and see what happens. Well, the temperature is now at about 80. So I'm going to let it go up to about 88, 90, and then we'll see what happens. You could also check it with an infrared thermometer if you want. And what I see now is about the same reading as what we have on the analog dial. All right, so let me take it back out. And it's hot, guys. So you can actually see that the thermostat is open right there. And if it's going to cool down, it will close up again. So this is actually working pretty well. You see, it's already kind of like closing again because it's cooling down and the wax is getting hard. So this thermostat is working pretty well. So what you have just seen is that the old thermostat opens and closes at the right temperature. The new one is doing exactly the same thing, so there is really no need to replace this thermostat in this car. Now, in your case, if your thermostat was not opening up, then you should replace it, or it was opening up way off the stated temperature, then you should probably as well change it, and it should be able to close again afterwards. So you might want to test this out a couple of times. Now, the next thing we're going to do is to check the thermo switch inside the um, thermostat housing. So now we're going to test the sensor which is driving the fan. And the sensor is mounted on the thermostat housing and in my case uh, it's a 98 degree sensor. So in other words, whenever the temperature reaches 98 degrees centigrade, the switch will close between the two contacts. And to verify that, I'm going to use what we call an ohmmeter and I'm just going to check for continuity and I will connect the two clips to the two contacts and then I will heat up the housing and I will blow some hot air through it until we have 98 degrees and see if that switch is actually closing at that time. Then we let it cool down again and we'll see if the switch is going to uh, open up again. So, um, there's not a lot of, of it to it, so let me turn my dial to continuity. And you can hear the beep already, uh, so if I have continuity I have a beep and a zero indication. So if I connect this up now to the switch, 
then right now I should have no sound or no continuity because it's cold. And in fact we have no continuity. So what I'm going to do now is to blow some hot air through it uh, until we reach the proper temperature. And I'm going to move things around a bit so you can actually see it. So everything is set up and we are ready to blow some hot air through the thermostat housing and I'm going to use a paint stripper for that. But I'm not going to force it too quickly. You want to pretend that it's the engine is warming up in a normal way. So let's check um, what the actual temperature is right now. And as you can see, this is 16 degrees centigrade. Yeah, it's a bit chilly here, but yeah, it's already October. So um, let's heat it up. Now let's see what the temperature is by now. Well, it's not much, it's only 18, so I'm going to crank up the heat a bit, little bit by little bit. 92. There we go. I should stop it. And, and you can hear the beep. Now we have continuity. That means the switch is now closed and let's check the temperature. And right now it's 91 degrees. Uh, of course that is not a 100% accurate reading, but that's good. Of course it's already cooling down. We are now at 90. And we'll see whenever the continuity is broken. Uh, so when the switch opens up, at what temperature it does open. There we go, it just happened. At 88, the switch opens up again. So this uh, temperature switch is working real well. I had to remove quite a bit of stuff on this car to get to the water pump. So I removed already the fan. I also will have to remove the radiator. And I want to make sure that I don't scrape it anywhere uh, because that would not be good. And now we have access to the water pump and putting it back together is going to be a bit of a problem again because this is really tight on this car. But that's what you have to do sometimes. You may have to take a lot of things apart to be able to get to your water pump. Um, some cars is easy, this was a difficult one. So now let's take the pump off. I already undid quite some bolts, so I just need to do undo one, so not to waste your time. All right, so um, let's remove the last bolt and then we should be able to wiggle it off. And as you can see, the old water pump isn't too bad. Uh, it makes a little bit of noise if you turn it. But not a lot, uh, but overall I think the scoops are still quite all right. So I could have left this pump on, but I decided not to. So let's look inside the housing on how that looks like. It doesn't look too bad overall. Um, I don't see too much debris in it, but I do see some wear and tear here. There's quite a bit here, see that? This is where the water goes in and there is quite a bit of wear and tear. So. Um, I can't change that part or I will not change this part now. I will fit the new water pump, but if this would have been worse, then I probably would have changed that as well. So if we had a bad water pump, uh, we would now put the new water pump up and we would remove first of all the seal, uh, put the new gasket up, uh, probably like so. Um, and then uh, we would install the water pump, the new water pump in it, bolt it all down, put it to torque and I'm not going to show you all this because it all depends on your car. Um, and then we would put the fan back and the radiator and then also of course the thermostat will go back and place the thermostat house. We would cable it all back up, put the hoses back up and then we would fill up the car with cooling liquid. And that really there is all to it. And by that time your car should be in a very good condition. If you have a hose where you're going to have an air trap then there are ways to fix that. What I have here is from OSP, a self-sealing kit um, with, and it comes with different fittings. So you can actually fit this from the inside of the hose, lock it down through a hole, and then you can put a bleeding nipple on it or whatever you want to put on it. It comes with a stamp, and this is a stamp that you need to knock through, and then you have a nice opening. Of course, you need to support something underneath, and then you just put that bolt through it together with this uh, seal and then 
the nut on the top and now you have in this case a M10 fitting on the inside so I can fit anything I want to it. So I'm going to fit the bleeding nipple to this and that's about it. There's nothing more to it. So folks, we have reached the end of this video and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I've tried to show you on how you can troubleshoot your cooling system if you have a problem with it. I also have shown you on how you can replace certain parts. And now for me, there's a lot of work left to put it all back together because I took things off that weren't really necessary on this specific car, but that's all right. That was just for the sake of the video. So I will put all this back together very soon. And I guess um, I might have to make another video uh, showing you on how to fill up the car with fresh cooling liquid, maybe a little bit about the cooling liquid itself. And then you can see it when everything is back together. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be a video or not. I still need to think about it. But anyhow, uh, please uh, put up your comments if you have any. And um, I'm always willing to listen to you. So I'll see you in my next video. Bye bye.